Welcome to Leader You by Black River Performance Management, where we believe work should fuel the human spirit, not drain it. In this leadership podcast, we will dive into the lived experiences of people flourishing in today's workplace and beyond. Join us to hear real life examples of experiences from our own lives and from the leaders we know and trust. Thank you for joining the Leader You podcast. Today, I am have the pleasure of introducing George Pitagorsky. He brings over 50 years of personal experience applying mindfulness, yoga, servant leadership, orientation, and systems and process thinking to help individuals, teams, and organizations to perform optimally. He's a master coach, facilitator, and consultant. He shares insights, tools, and techniques in his articles and books, The Zen Approach to Project Management, Managing managing Conflicts in Projects, Managing Expectations, A Mindful Approach to Achieving Optimal Performance, and How to Be Happy Even When You're Sad, Mad, or Scared. Through his decades of a decades-long career, George has played roles as a globally recognized project, program, and process management expert, teacher, speaker, coach, and executive. He's been a CIO for a multi-billion dollar government agency, a principal in two technology startups, an executive director of program development for an international learning organization, and an executive manager and consultant in large-scale IT systems, implementation, organizational change, and process improvement programs across multiple industries. What a wisdom well we have with us today. Um, the reason I asked you on the podcast is because you had worked with Rob, uh, my husband, in some different areas, and he just has so many amazing things to say about you. And he thought you could add so much value and so much wisdom to the podcast. So I'm really grateful to have you, and I can't wait to talk about the a competency. It's it's not on our leadership competencies, but it absolutely is. It's called mindfulness, and um, I'm excited to see where this conversation goes. But uh, thank you for joining us, and let's let's uh, hear a little bit about your story, George. Well, that's it. My story. It, it can be cut down uh, from the resume, which is <laughs> long and complicated. It's one of the benefits, I guess, or liabilities of living long. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, my story uh, in this context goes back to a decision that I made uh, in the uh, early 1970s to become a yogi. And not a yogi that, you know, uh, stands on his head, but a person who... Uh, uh, in the world, seeks to uh, be living as best as one can, and to uh, continuously learn in that uh, in that way that enables letting go of anything that gets in the way of that uh, living as best as you can. Mm -hmm. So I, I've had the good fortune of applying that in uh, organizational situations and family. Uh, dropping out for a couple of years to uh, you know to explore the uh, the non-commercial uh, realm, uh, and then uh, you know coming back into the commercial realm and realizing that there's no dichotomy between uh, being a yogi or, or a seeker or somebody that uh, just wants to have a good life, you yeah. know, and working in the material world. Two things go hand in hand, in fact. Yeah. So that's more or less my story. I mean, I can go through like, you know, all of the business projects and stuff like that. But that, uh, that's bottom line story. So how, how many years did it take you to get to the point where you were, if you felt competent in this yogi or like kind of where you've mastered that skill of, or are you still, is it still? Still, you know, it's one is constantly working on it more and more. I mean, for me, I had uh, uh, from like 1972, 72, 73 into the, uh, the 80s, I had a significant amount of time to uh, practice intensive yoga, to uh, uh, go on retreats, uh, study with, uh, you know, some world-class teachers. So, and, you know, in that, one becomes uh, more and more comfortable with this kind of uh, attention that one is paying to, uh, you know, to, to oneself in effect. Mm -hmm. and, 
at the same time being in the in the world. So it took me, you know, it, and it's taking me all of this time, you know, for 50 some odd years. It's like you're always a beginner. Mm -hmm. uh, and as soon as you think that you're not, then uh, uh, something is going to smack you in the back of the head like a Zen teacher. You know? <laughs> uh, and further, I think, you know, it's a, uh, I take the position that someone doesn't have to study for, uh, you know, for 40, 50 years in a, you know, in a formal uh, involvement with meditation and uh, you know philosophy and all of that stuff. Though I um, personally, that's what I, I you know found a, as a way. But I think somebody can get it just like that. You, know? mm -hmm. like you could be playing ping pong and and realizing that you're in the moment. You're not thinking about anything other than what's happening. You're not even thinking about what's happening. Mm -hmm. You're just in that position of flow. And if you get the recognition of that, then there's the desire to uh, to re-experience that perhaps. Mm -hmm. And then you find some methods, some, you know, mindfulness meditation, uh, any number of different possibilities. Yeah. And then you, uh, you, know, you just are then in a uh, situation where at any given moment you might awaken for like 30 seconds and then go back into not being awakened, and then you can come back, and you know, and it becomes a dance, an interesting dance. Yeah. So, <laughs> have you taught that? Have you taught mindfulness with um, some of the people you've coached, and and could you share some yeah. of those experiences? Yeah, I've uh, uh, shared. Let me say this: that the mindfulness is one of, uh, I would say, three major aspects of finding that place of. Uh, uh, optimal performance, optimal living. And the other two are uh, wisdom and uh, ethical or skillful behavior. So when when I, I what I taught is I've taught mindfulness classes and done some videos and things like that that uh, just basically teach the technique mm -hmm. and open up what mindfulness is as a, uh, a quality of mind, a uh, way of uh, a part of the mind that everybody has. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, every yeah, everyone pretty much has the capacity to objectively observe whatever is occurring, and we do it more often than we think. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, yeah, I've taught that, and I've found that uh, people that I've coached, people that I've uh, trained in uh, in other kinds of uh, settings and teams and team building and stuff like that, um, I found that. Uh, People can get the understanding and the capacity to do that very, very easily, mm -hmm. and then that opens them up to the uh, to the wisdom aspect and to the ability to see in a context of their lives where this capability to be mindful puts them. Mm -hmm. What happens when someone becomes mindful? And, you know, they, that, the answer to that in part is these capabilities of leadership. Mm -hmm. you know, when one becomes mindful, one is usually more effective in uh, interpersonal skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like a, hmm? It's like self-aware, self-awareness of yeah, what's going exactly. on. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So self-awareness is the starting point for emotional intelligence and the... Uh, underlying capacity for self-awareness is mindfulness mm -hmm. yeah so mindfulness enables self-awareness and self-awareness enables both uh, emotional intelligence social intelligence and that is now giving me the capacity to influence others more effectively absolutely you know, in interpersonally uh, communicating and uh, managing and leading and all of that stuff negotiation, conflict, all of those elements of in, our interpersonal uh, relationships become much more uh, effective with this base of mindfulness. Yeah, that's amazing. So yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask, um, are there any stories of people that you've helped or coached and you saw such a transformation um, based on them improving their mindfulness 
um, capabilities. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I have one uh, person that I coach who uh, came because of a uh, desire to uh, relieve stress that, that, you know, that, that she thought was um, self-imposed. She'd been in therapy for a long time and she was under a lot of stress. We, you know, I don't want to go into the, you know, the specifics of, mm -hmm. the, of the case, but she's a relatively high powered uh, uh, person in a professional in the finance industry. Uh, very analytical and, you know, social at the same time. Um, but over, I, mean, I worked with her for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And over that time, integrating mindfulness and a mindset change that enabled her to see how important letting go was. She has reported, you know, a significant uh, increased capability to manage difficult situations and circumstances, which arise not only in her business situations, but in her family life. Mm -hmm. They interchange, so, they intersect for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I've, you know, I've had a number of uh, people re report uh, life-changing experiences as well as just getting better at uh, focusing, for example. Mm -hmm. you know, some people come to, uh, to mindfulness meditation because they you find that their mind is too scattered. There are too many, you know, internal interruptions. So using this practice, one can uh, hone their con uh, their concentration capability. Mm -hmm. which now means that instead of spinning off in, you know, some uh, random thought while I'm intending to do something that requires my focus, I'm better at seeing the movement away and Sustain, you know, sustaining the uh, the focus. So that's a, a in effect a side effect, but that's often what I get reported back as being a major breakthrough for some people, mm -hmm. without getting into kind of any kind of self awareness mm -hmm. or any other uh, mental state uh, uh, manipulations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it can be very very simple, very structured on a really practical. And it's all practical, but on a very uh, impersonal level, it's mechanics, mm -hmm. you know, to be mindful, simply, you know, who wouldn't want to be mindful? You might trip over things. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want to be mind. You, you want to hone your mindfulness, very practical thing to do. Mm -hmm. And then you want to be able to decide on what to concentrate on and, you know, and be able to do that. That almost um, covers anything else that you want to do. Mm -hmm. Puts you in a position to do anything. Yeah. yeah. And it's definitely a skill that takes a lot of practice. It's not something you just pick up and, you know, turn on a light switch. Yeah. Yeah. It's like going to the gym. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go to the gym three times, you'll feel a little stronger and uh, you stop going and your flabbiness returns. Uh, it's something that, one learns to do, and then one takes the effort to sustain the uh, practice. Mm -hmm. and it's a practice. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting practice because the more one uh, sustains it, the less effort it takes to sustain. Interesting. It becomes something that uh, that kind of seeps into your life. It becomes a normal way of operating. Mm -hmm. So you're not actually adding any effort to be mindful. It's just you're mindful. Mm -hmm. And as that is occurring, and it occurs, you know, more and more or less um, over time. It's not, you know, it's not something that happens immediately, but you start to see that your mindfulness has uh, become a habit. Mm -hmm. It's become your normal way of operating. So how would you, I love this because I love like the power of habit, atomic habits, all that, like just creating little tiny shifts, little 1% shifts um, in the way that we do things. Um, what would you say would be some great micro habits that somebody could start to incorporate into their daily practice? Yeah. And I, uh, you know, I could I break the meditation practice into two uh, parts, formal and informal. So these day-to-day, moment-to-moment uh, little tips, the phone rings. Instead of answering it immediately or starting to think about what you're going to say, uh, let it ring three times. 
And in that period of ringing three times, you're coming in contact with your uh, physical sensations, your posture at that time, your breath, and then you answer the phone. Mm -hmm. So you're using the ringing of the phone as a, as a signal mm. to be Trigger. mindfully aware mm -hmm. in that moment. Mm -hmm. I love that. If, and there are a zillion things that you can that you're doing in your life that you can now turn into signals to be more, more and more mindful. And the more of those things that you apply, the more likely it is that your mindfulness will spread to everything. Mm -hmm. Because you start to see that at any moment you can just, for a split second, be conscious of your uh, posture, of your body, your breath, and your thinking. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the answer to the question of what what do you bring to the practice, what kind of techniques are there to uh, you know to to uh, to use to hone this quality of mindfulness. So. Uh, I break it down into two parts, formal and informal. The formal practice is uh, you carve out an amount of time, find a spot that uh, is likely not to be uh, interrupted in a quiet space, and you sit or stand or you know lie down. You, your posture is, is open. But more often than not, we suggest sitting with a straight back, but comfortably erect. Not, mm -hmm. you know, rigid mm -hmm. in any way. Comfortably erect, and you now sit, and you come in touch with the uh, sensations of your breath. You feel the sensations of your body. Mm -hmm. The weight against the chair, the air against the skin, and you maintain that awareness while observing any thoughts, feelings, physical sensations, et cetera. And if you get lost, carried away in any thoughts, you come back to the sensations of the breath and the body. That's a form, and you do that for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. We, you know, you can work up to 45 minutes. Some people, you know, really get carried away. So we all sit for an hour or more. But uh, any amount of time that you choose, stick to it. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole range of experiences. You know, it's a technique that uh, simple, but not necessarily easy. And there are interesting uh, detours around in it and so forth. So you need, you know, some place to get uh, more instruction over time. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, the so that's the formal. And you choose a time of day, two times a day, whatever. The informal is now... You're sitting at a desk, the phone rings, and instead of answering the phone immediately, you now let it ring three times. And in the period of the three rings, you're finding that comfortable, erect posture. You're coming in touch with your body and your breath, just for that three rings of the telephone. And then you choose to answer, not answer, whatever it is that uh, that comes next effectively, you do. Mm -hmm. Now you start to use anything that you can as a signal for that moment of mindfulness. Yeah. It's like a mini break. Right. Ma making, pouring your first cup of coffee in the morning. Exactly. Something, that, a routine, a brushing your teeth, exactly. feeling it, right? Like just... Any time, the feeling of yeah. shampooing your hair, what's your body, the water coming down. Exactly. Instead exactly. of having that monkey brain in the shower yeah. where you're thinking of everything yeah. you got to do and what you, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Walking is another, uh, you know, like another situation where you can, mm -hmm. you know, how easy it is to, you know, to just spin off into, you know, like monkey mind. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and just be present mm -hmm. in the movement. Mm -hmm. Feel it. Feel the sun. Feel the wind. Feel the. Yeah. And then choose if you want to be caught up in some, you know, mind trip. You mm -hmm. can do that. Mm -hmm. But beware that you might trip over something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you have a, quite a few books that you've written, and so I'm curious as to how mindfulness 
uh, relates to some of the topics you've written on? Well, I've, uh, the two books, I've written the three books that are in that realm. So uh, the Zen approach to project management is basically applying a combination of mindfulness and awareness of uh, emotional intelligence, social intelligence, the need for focus, and the need to be precise and do, in this case, project management as if it were a Zen art. Mm -hmm. Zen art is something that re you know, requires significant precision and at the same time, the recognition that the artistry, the craft itself is just an object that's used for practice. Mm -hmm. So it's merging this idea of con consistently practicing mindfulness and what goes with mindfulness, the open, the openness, the elimination of unnecessary stress, the ability to concentrate and applying that to your uh, task at hand and recognizing that your task at hand is a great learning situation. Mm -hmm. So you can now learn from any flaws that you might uh, make in the, in the work and then seeing how you might be reacting to that and recognizing that your reaction is maybe not something that you want to use as the driver for your behavior and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that's the, you know, the Zen approach to uh, the project management book. And then I've, I've written on conflict management and on uh, expectations management. Mm -hmm. In both cases, it's applying uh, one's awareness of oneself and one's internal process, as well as awareness of others and their process to the degree that you actually have access to that. Mm -hmm. And then skillfully uh, managing a set of techniques, like negotiation techniques, as a, as a simple example, mm -hmm. so or conflict management techniques in that context, and doing it in, in a way that is in keeping with your role. So, and it talk and the, particularly the conflict management uh, book talks about how to uh, promote win win as opposed to win lose type of scenarios and so forth, mm -hmm. and recognizes that sometimes you can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's a zero sum game and, uh, you know, somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. And to be able to accept that and go beyond the animosity that might occur as a result of realizing that you got to beat this other person mm -hmm. and uh, come from a different place, more of a heartfelt kind of uh, competition. Yeah. Uh, so, so we've got that. And, uh, and in the expectations management uh, realm, we're talking about uh, how expectations drive people's responses to whatever it is that one is experiencing. So if expectations are rational and one is aware of them as being expectations, then it's much less likely that one will get caught up in reaction, reaction type of behavior. Mm -hmm. They won't be disappointed because they realize that it was an expectation. And uh, while they might feel disappointment because they didn't achieve what it is that they expected to achieve, they're not taken out by it. Mm -hmm. What I mean by taken out, they're not, they, they don't want to react. They don't uh, experience reactive behavior based on anger or mm -hmm. sadness or what have you. Mm -hmm. They don't hold on. Would you say that they might just still feel it, but then they move past it because they understand? They might, let's just say, let's say it's a person and they had expectations that that person would show up for them or do something more for them and the person doesn't. And then they recognize the feelings of um, maybe, maybe they don't care about me as much or maybe they don't like me or whatever their thoughts are, the, all the spinning out on the thoughts, but maybe that they recognize, well, now I'm thinking all of this and, and, and maybe this is the only capacity they actually have. Yeah, yeah. It, mindfulness, you know, what you've just ex expressed is a uh, experience of mindfulness of one's feelings, mm -hmm. one's internal process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 
there's nothing about mindfulness that says that there's anything wrong with that. That is what's happening. Mm -hmm. And part of the, you remember I said that there are three components, there's mindfulness and then there's wisdom. Mm -hmm. The wisdom of knowing that accepting what is, is the key to happy life. It is. (laughs) (laughs) Surrendering. you're accepting the fact that you're experiencing these emotions, these this react, the reaction internally. Mm-hmm. But you're, and if you get stuck in that, and allow the emotions to now take over and drive your behavior, now you've shifted into an unskillful situation. Mm-hmm. Having the capacity to be mindful of it all, and having the uh, concentrative capability choose what to do next mm-hmm. be able to sit with an itch mm-hmm. oh i love you know? that be able to sit with an itch that's i'm going to use that one because that's exactly what it feels like and you want to respond you want to say something the ego wants to i don't think you as the person as the soul as the being wants to but the ego wants to react or respond yes so now it's the other part of your ego that is uh, decided to uh, not uh, let the part of your ego that is reactive take over comes into play and you now choose to you know slowly slowly let go of those feelings it doesn't have to be you know you don't you don't want to push them away mm-hmm. to suppress them is unskillful yeah but to allow them and let them take their course Mm-hmm. You know, it's one of my teachers talks about uh, allowing everything in. You know, you got a house, you got a house with an open door, everything comes in, but you don't want to serve certain things tea. Mm-hmm. You don't want them to stick around, you know? Mm-hmm. So they're going to come in, you see them, uh, nice to see you, bye. Mm-hmm. Uh, that kind of movement of mm-hmm. the mind, mm-hmm. not getting stuck. Mm-hmm. I found naming them and tames them too. Naming them and taming them. Like, <laughs> What is that feeling? Well, I'm feeling, I'm feeling uh, maybe like I don't belong or I'm not wanted. And is it a truth? I mean, sometimes just pausing and creating that space of, is that actually true? Or is that just a lens I've been looking through my life yeah. at because of circumstances or instances that have happened? Yes. Yeah. It's exactly the, that kind of approach. Mm-hmm. The labeling is a yeah, very useful way. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a positive technique on the level that you're talking about, which is more the analytical aspect mm-hmm. of it. But it also trains the mind to see feelings and experiences as objects. You yeah. Know, because once I step back and start to see it all as objects, now I have the ability to see, well, is this, where is this coming from? Mm-hmm. What's the cause? Yeah, the root what cause. Yeah, mm-hmm. what's the cause, the root cause, and then mm-hmm. there you go. And so as as someone's learning to do this and, and practice it, I think it becomes, like you said, more of a habit. You don't, you don't have to work as hard, but in the beginning, it's the path of most resistance. Yeah, it's effortful. It requires effort. Mm-hmm. I'm... I'm Towards hopefully the end of writing a uh, a new book on uh, optimal living. Oh yeah. And, uh, I use the image of a uh, uh, peaceful warrior. You know this quality of being able to. Uh, I thought I said it all. Anyway, okay. so sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, see, this is an example of how mindfulness is very, becomes very useful and accepting what is becomes mm-hmm. very useful. Mm-hmm. At one point in my life, I might have uh, been taken out by that interruption. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, it's happened past. I don't want it to happen again, so I'm going to figure out how to turn off the sound of my mm-hmm. phone. But uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, it's just an example of how we live life in, in that way of not being reactive. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so the saying is that uh, the effort in the beginning, requires not only establishing some kind of time, you know, a little bit of time, not so much time necessarily, but the effort of not scratching an itch, mm-hmm. not scratching an itch, mm-hmm. is significant. It is, and even more so, not acting out of anger, 
if you tend towards that mm-hmm. is even more difficult. It is. So, and then on top of that, looking at the underlying, you mentioned root cause, looking at the underlying cause of these kinds of things is daunting. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of people just don't want to do it. It's there's too much scary stuff down there. Mm-hmm. And if one is not ready or wanting to go down into that realm of an- analyzing those kinds of causes, one still gains from being able to choose not to do that mm-hmm. and also not to have react mm-hmm. you know, just on a on a conditioning basis. Mm-hmm. Cognitive you know, therapy works at that level. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Then, I feel like the longer you continue to go down a path of scratching the itch, the more you go, you, you scratch, you, it becomes more and more just like the other way. If you go, it's, it's, you're working towards one thing or the other growth or decay. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's growth or decay. It's also the, uh, you know, the, the whole notion of, uh, neural pathways and our abilities to, uh, to change the way we think based on the habits that we or the you know the actions that we take Mm -hmm. so with uh as you were saying if i'm constantly reinforcing that when i get an itch i scratch it that becomes burned in Mm -hmm. that becomes you know hard almost hardwired yeah so now it takes effort to change a habit changing habits is you know is is probably one of the more difficult things that we do like smoking now right it's like smoking or, or something yes, like that. Exactly. Yeah. So you are changing a habit and you now are experiencing the pain that comes from changing a habit. Mm-hmm. Physical. Right. Yeah. So you now have to make a decision. Well, do I want to go through this uh, discomfort or not? Mm-hmm. If I don't want to go through the con- discomfort, I take a pill, I smoke a cigarette, I do whatever it is that uh, that one does to go past it, mm-hmm. you know, to not to not really have to experience it. Mm-hmm. But some aren't satisfied with that. Of course, it might not be healthy. It's, mm-hmm. You know, it just doesn't give them that ability to be uh, kind of content and happy mm-hmm. on a deeper level. So they uh, now will dive in mm-hmm. a little bit, make the commitment. To be yeah. a peaceful warrior. Right. So how, what do you see or what are some signals that you see that somebody's ready for this kind of change or transformation? Well, one, they don't have to be miserable, but they have to be experiencing some kind of uh, suffering. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, that's what brings people to the to the table for changing things. Yeah. So if I'm in a, in a realm where there's nothing wrong and I don't have any, you know, I don't have any problems, well, we don't want to change anything. Right. You know, everything is okay. So now, so we have uh, some suffering breaks through. You know, the, uh, the, a little bit of reality comes into play. And then uh, we start to see that, uh, well, I can accept this much of that suffering, but this much more I don't want to accept. Mm-hmm. So I get to this point of now coming in contact, let's say, with someone or something or some you know, teaching that says that you can eliminate all of this unnecessary suffering. So I say, hey, that's not a bad idea. I'm I mean, down. Anything. Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you're lucky, you don't get caught up in a cult of some sort. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you find way of building into your life this kind of uh, um, process mm-hmm. you know you're you're taking a bit more control of your life process by seeking out different techniques for uh, keeping your body in good shape keeping your mind in good shape and uh, being better at your relationships and so forth and depending on how far you go in that inner uh, seeking you reach different levels of comfort mm-hmm. for different amounts of time in your in your day and your life you know absolutely yeah I, a level of comfort and, and a little less suffering is 
what the world really does need. Uh, more of that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. A little more space and a little more grace. Yeah. So, you know, and uh, you know, it, it's it's an interesting uh, journey. You know, it's it's a journey that we're on. Mm -hmm. That uh, you know, once there's a decision that's made to uh, integrate this kind of quality of mind and, and heart that we're talking about, how does that relate to the world of business and organizations mm -hmm. and our capacity to earn a living right. in an effective way and to be in relationships and so forth? And my findings is that there, not only is there no conflict between being at peace and happy in, in whatever situation you are and being totally effective. Mm -hmm. The more one can get into that notion of flow, mm -hmm. the ability to just be uh, an expression of your past knowledge, your experience, your capabilities, and all of that, and allow that to, to exhibit itself in your actions, you're going to be as good as you can possibly be. Yeah, because yeah. you're present, you're fully present, you're fully, you're under, you're just being where you are instead of what all you've got to do and all the thinking and that, that whole monkey brain that if you don't recognize it, you just get into that process and it's hard to get out of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what mindfulness does, it gives you the ability to uh, see it before you get stuck in it. Mm -hmm. But also, once you see it and are stuck in it, you bring the wisdom of knowing that it's temporary into play as opposed to getting you know anxious about not being able to get at it, mm -hmm. out of it. And then as it leaves and you become more capable of uh, making an intention, you intend not to get there again. And it's just that, that training mm -hmm. of the mind to see it when it's coming up mm -hmm. before it becomes too difficult to change. Yeah. There's always going to be thinking like that. Yeah, you can't get rid of it. You can't get rid of emotions. I mean, we're human beings. This is the struggle, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But it's understanding techniques and, and ways to quiet the mind, get into yeah. the space of flow, having more and more. I was reading some research the other day about flow and how um, when we get to that space, and, and way, they're researching more ways to get to it more often. Yes. Do you yes, have any of that? Do you have any information on that? Yeah, yeah. I one of the uh, you know aspects of this book that uh, that I'm uh, writing is to recognize that flow in the beginning seems to be something that only you know super athletes or you know like artists that are so focused on what they're doing. But anytime you can let go into an activity without the thinking about. You know, with this thinking going on, you know, you're obviously making a decision to, you know, drive a nail into a particular board in a particular place. But that thinking is coming out of your experience and your need for operating in the moment. Mm -hmm. It's the, well, if I don't put it here and I, you know, put my finger in the wrong place, I'm going to hit my finger with a cap with a with the hammer. That's thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, And if you get caught up in that, you're likely to hit yourself with a hammer. Mm -hmm. uh, if you just let your normal capabilities out and express themselves, more and more you'll exercise flow in everything. Yeah. Doing the dishes. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of spinning out on whatever one spins out on in that, in, in that situation, there's the sensation of the water, there's the movement of the plates without labeling them in any way, just experiencing the feeling, the felt sense mm -hmm. of being in that space. Yeah. The posture, the activity becomes your object and then you let go into the activity. And if the spinning out starts again, you bring your back, mm -hmm. yourself back until it becomes so natural to be happily washing dishes that why would you even want to spin out? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I noticed that dishes and cleaning is, or even taking a shower, 
those are some of the ones where my head spins out the most and I have to be mindful of there it goes. And and, and now I just got to bring myself back here because all of what I've got to do. And, and I find that that nervous energy gets really amplified more by the more cleaning or the more doing and all of things. And it's really, you have to really kind of reel it in and go, I'm just going to do the dishes right now and feel doing the dishes versus yeah. thinking of everything. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a paradox. Mm -hmm. The paradox is that on one level, exactly what you're saying is what you want to you know, accomplish. You want to be doing the dishes when you're doing the dishes. But there's also a, you know, a usefulness of spinning out. It's telling that experience is telling you something. Mm -hmm. It's telling you that you need to spend some time allowing the spinning out to take place mm -hmm. without getting caught up in it. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. But to allow it to be there and to see it as if you were sitting behind the waterfall. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And doing having that aspect of it, there's less force that's needed to bring yourself into that calm space. Mm -hmm. And you start to see that you can be in that calm space, even in the midst of the, uh, you know, the, the hyper behavior. Mm -hmm. you know? Right. Yeah. I love that. But it's, it's relaxing sometimes to let yourself just spin out. It is. Sometimes it is. <laughs> just think, 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 think away, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes it's just kind of planning, oh, I didn't think about that or I forgot about this or, you know, just whatever. I don't even, I think we have like 60,000 thoughts a day. Is that right? I don't know. I never counted them, but yeah, it's, you know, it's on that. Order. <laughs> on the research, I think I've seen that like, yeah, yeah. And, and most of them are the same thoughts too. Yes. They repeat. Yeah. Yeah. And they are, you know, they're associated with these neural pathways that we have because, you know, they're generated from somewhere, but then we reinforce them and deal with them over and over again. So, so the, you know, the process that, you know, that we talked about before, the formal sitting, which can be very, very small or even non-existent, mm -hmm. and then the moment-to-moment -moment activities, the deciding mm -hmm. to come back to that center, to come mm -hmm. back to that place behind the waterfall. Mm -hmm. I refer to it as the eye of the storm. Mm -hmm. And if people are familiar with mandalas, you know, these uh, global pictures in the center of every mandala is you. Mm -hmm. And if everything else is just occurring, mm -hmm. including your internal process. Yeah. You know, so it's like that. Yeah, I love it. Uh, I think this is super helpful, and it's gotten me more curious about researching mindfulness, reading a couple of your books. Um, I, I have s some basic knowledge, but I'd like to to just tap into it a little bit more and, and incorporate more of the practice. Um, I think I do. I'm, I'm on a pretty good path. I've been working on it for a while, but I think there's a lot of room for improvement in my um, in my life, and I am sure my listeners um, are wanting more peace and less suffering and less anxiety and less stress, um, burnout, and all the things that we're facing right now. And so, um, what are three pieces of advice that you have learned, or um, words, some wisdom that could help our listeners as a gift to them um, to just add more mindfulness to their lives? Well, uh First thing is to uh, cultivate a capacity to accept things as they are, to let go and to accept things as they are without being fatalistic about it. You know, so accepting things as they are now doesn't mean that you can't act in some way to, to work to change things. Mm -hmm. So accepting, uh, letting go. You're hanging on a branch that's in the bank of a fast rushing river and you can keep hanging on until you have to let go because you have no more energy and you splash into this water and you don't have any energy left so you're just carried away or you can let go into the flow and use your energy and your skills to navigate the river mm, i love that so letting go in that way and mm -hmm. still having the capacity to uh, use your capa your capabilities. Mm -hmm. 
And then the third is to is be as happy as you can possibly be. Be you know find a place inside of you that is just so comfortable, so delightfully at peace that it becomes your home. And it's there. You know, it's just a question of uh, letting go of all of the stuff that keeps us from coming in touch and being in touch with that. Wow, there's so much wisdom here. I could, <laughs> I might need to have some coaching. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> It's incredible. I love it. And I, I really would like to get some of your books. Um, and I'll, I'll get in touch with you after this podcast, but I'm just, I'm, on Amazon. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I am so grateful for your time and I know that you're your most valuable resource. And I know that our listeners will really appreciate, um, these tips that you have given on how to, you know, it's just how to become a little bit more mindful. Some books you gave some um, opportunities for them to explore and become for mind, more mindful, and and actually explained it in a way where they can see how it actually works in the workplace as well. Um, I, I think there's a disconnect for some people to understand how it impacts your personal life and your professional life. It's not just something that you can do at home, but you can practice it for two minutes at your desk. And before you make a decision, before you have uh, a one-on-one -on -one with somebody, um, it's such a great leadership skill. And as you said before, I mean, it covers so many of the leadership competencies that we are discussing that that's one of the reasons we wanted to bring mindfulness into it because it's hard to really negotiate without being, negotiate well without being mindful to be have good interpersonal skills without being mindful and all of the things. So, yeah. Thank you so much oh, for your time. Pleasure. Yeah. Well, Thank you. yes, I really appreciate it. Thank you.